A Ukraine war even more brutal than we imagined, putting in perspective other news of a regime change at the Fed and the ambitions of the world's richest man. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This week, special contributor Larry Summers of Harvard on where we go from here. Look, I think the risks are going way up. Recession in the next uh, couple of years is clearly more likely than not. And Rushir Sharma of Rockefeller International on the good news for emerging markets. The decades when commodity prices do well tend to be the decade for emerging markets. A lot happened this week, but it all faded in the glaring light of the images of alleged war crimes committed by Russian troops in northern Ukraine. You may remember I got criticized for calling Putin a war criminal. Well, the truth of the matter, you saw what happened to Vukic. He is a war criminal. We have to continue to provide Ukraine with the weapons they need to continue the fight. Which led to calls on both sides of the Atlantic for even more sanctions against Russia. The U.S. Treasury has halted dollar debt payments from Russian government accounts at U.S. financial institutions. It's the first known sanction since alleged atrocities committed by Russian troops in the Ukrainian town of Bucha were discovered. The U.S., EU and G7 are coordinating a fresh round of sanctions on Moscow following the discovery of civilian murders in Ukrainian towns. But despite the horror unfolding in Europe, the week did hold other news, like Elon Musk using a small piece of his $270 billion fortune to plant his flag on Twitter. Of course, on the not so surprising news that Elon Musk is now joining the board. So his 9.2% stake, not so passive as uh, expected. With Katie Stanton of Moxie Ventures suggesting what may come next for Twitter. Well, I think it's a very expensive way to get yourself an edit button. We even had President Biden welcoming his former boss back to the White House for the first time, celebrating the anniversary of the Affordable Care Act that they got passed together. Welcome back to the White House, man. Feels like the good old days. And no week would be complete without a focus on the Fed and where it goes next. And we heard from a range of Fed officials, like Esther George at the Kansas City Fed, about rate hikes and the balance sheet. I think 50 basis points is going to be an option that we'll have to consider, along with other things. And again, I'm very focused on thinking about how the balance sheet moves in conjunction with policy rate increases. All that talk about rates and the balance sheet, well, they took their toll, especially on bonds, with the 10-year adding nearly 32 basis points, ending up the week at 2.7 percent. And that inverted yield curve we talked about last Friday, well, it turned around by some 28 basis points. Though bonds moved the most this week, stocks were hit as well, particularly tech stocks, with the Nasdaq down nearly 3.9 percent for the week and the S&P 500 giving up nearly 1.3 percent. As you might expect, those higher yields strengthened the dollar. On Friday, it was up for the seventh straight day, leaving the index around its highest level since 2020. To sort all of this out for us, we welcome now Rebecca Patterson, Bridgewater Chief Investment Strategist, and Greg Peters, PGM Fixed Income Co-CIO. So welcome, both of you. Greg, I have to start with you. Fixed income's in your title. Fixed income did a lot of movement. What caused it this week? It's just the change in the Fed. Uh, so just a repricing in central banks uh, that's responding to inflation and stronger growth. So I think the fixed income market is telling you that the Fed has to hike even more than initially anticipated. Uh, and it's just been a a radical shift. And to put that in perspective, David, the uh, Austrian 100-year bond is down 82 points since December. Wow, that, that's some perspective. So, so, Rebecca, was it just the, the Fed talk? Is that what did it? Or were there other factors as well behind the scenes? Well, the Fed was definitely the front and center driver of what's going on in bonds. But I link back to what's happening in Ukraine. You know, what we saw last year was a demand shock helped by all the stimulus that came through the pandemic. But now what the war has done is it's created or exacerbated the supply shock. And both of those things together have continued to push up not just inflation. We're going to get a CPI print out of the U.S. next week. I think we're looking for around 8.4, 8.5 percent for headline inflation. I know it's it takes <laughs> you back to the good old days. 
um, but it's also pushing up commodity prices. And the, the outlook for those commodity prices, it's hard to see them retracing quickly with the supply imbalances there that are created by cutting off Russian and, to a degree, Ukraine exports. So I think what the Fed's reacting to is not just what's happening here at home in the United States, but also the likely inflation that's going to be imported from what's happening overseas. And, Greg, one of the things we heard about this week was not just the rates issue, but also the balance sheet with Lael Brainerd saying, you know, we're really going to have to take it down a lot and faster than we thought. How much is that driving the market? It's a combination of the two. Uh, uh, and I agree with Rebecca that the inflation picture has shifted uh, given uh, the events uh, in Ukraine and the supply shocks uh, is just a one-two punch. So uh, I, I think it's a confluence of events, David, uh, and, um, you know, there is a repricing. The balance sheet uh, is almost an afterthought, but the minutes came out and suggested that's even going to be more aggressive. Uh, and so the Fed basically signaled to the market that they're behind a curve and they have to hike more dramatically than initially anticipated. 50s on the table, maybe not just once, but twice and multiple times. And they're rolling off the balance sheet uh, uh, in a more aggressive way as well. So there's been a real shift by the Fed in trying to catch up to this inflation picture. And, and just adding to Greg's point, you know, often people look at what's priced in for Fed funds futures to say, okay, how much tightening should we be expecting? We've only seen quantitative tightening, the reduction of the balance sheet once in 2017 to 19. So not much sample size to go off of. But what we're hearing now is the Fed is thinking about reducing that balance sheet at twice the rate that it did the last time around. And so it's not enough to look at what's priced in for rates. You have to think about that roll off of the balance sheet as well. And it's feeding into the flows into bonds. I mean, the big deal we're watching is banks. When the pandemic hit, everyone got all that stimulus. They put that money into deposits. Banks didn't want to hold deposits, so they recycled it into bonds. A lot of demand for bonds that kept yields low. Now that is all reversing. The deposit flow is slowing down. The banks don't want to put it into bonds when the, the curve is flatter. And so that demand for bonds is evaporating quickly. And that's another reason. It's all tied together, but it's another reason that yields have, have climbed so quickly and we think still have further to run. Let's talk about that curve that Rebecca just uh, mentioned, Greg. Uh, last Friday, it was inverted. Everybody was really concerned about that, what it might say about recession. As I say, it came back in the positive territory. It, it actually changed by 28 basis points over the course of the week. Does that, what does that tell us about recession? What are the chances of recession, do you think, right now? Yeah, I'm not reading too much in the uh, repricing in the curve this week. Um, I think uh, the the uh, the end term is uh, ultimately much uh, more inverted, so flatter and inverted. Um, uh, and I still believe that uh, the markets will increasingly price in a risk of a recession. So um, I think uh, what happened this week is not really that relevant to the bigger story, which is the Fed uh, will continue to hike until something breaks and trying to quell the inflation, uh, inflation fears um, and then throw the economy in recession. And just think about how recession risk has increased dramatically. So there was just a latest poll where uh, investors uh, were 50 percent of investors uh, see a recession uh, next year. So uh, it's a big shift and the uh, curve is uh, telling you that or will tell you that. Yeah, in fact, Rebecca, Bloomberg surveyed 72 economists, and they're up to 27.5 percent think that we'll have a recession within the next 12 months. And that's not 24 months, 12 months as a practical matter. When you talk about 8.4 percent, perhaps, on the CPI, can we have a soft landing in those circumstances? Does the Fed have to go so far to get that under control that it almost requires a recession? Well, that, that's the challenge, right? The Fed obviously doesn't want to engineer a recession. They want to engineer a soft landing. So they're going to have to choose if they're tightening enough to get inflation truly back to their target, which is just basically above 2 percent, there's a greater chance that they are going to trigger a recession. If they accept higher inflation, what is that doing to their inflation credibility? What does that do to longer term ex uh, inflation expectations? It is interesting that two years ago, we were all talking about you know, that we don't want to turn into Japan. We don't want to have um, structural deflation or disinflation. We need to change the inflation mindset. Well, we have. We're in a new inflation regime. And so you wonder if inflation didn't settle at two or two and a half, but at three or two and 75, would that be okay? Maybe the Fed would accept that um, if it could help them avoid uh, 
uh, a recession. So the, the challenge is, do you position for a recession or structurally higher inflation? Or maybe you start positioning for a little bit of both. And Greg, let me put you on the spot. You do something I don't do, which is interpret the bond market and what it's telling us. As I understand it, if you look out two or three years, the bond market's saying we will not have very high inflation. It's going to come back down. It's not. The bond market uh, has definitely been in this camp where uh, it is transitory. So the supply issues, uh, you know, take time to work out. That, uh, that's been in the price. Uh, what's also in the price is that the Fed can get uh, its handle uh, on inflation. That being said, David, uh, is that that has been moving up over time. So uh, there's less of a, a certainty uh, around that ability. Uh, but to me, uh, the messaging is clear. Uh, the Fed has to get inflation under control um, uh, because this is hurting kind of most Americans. Um, uh, and so to ignore it, I think, is uh, uh, at their peril. Uh, definitely politically, there's a lot of pressure as well. So to me, um, you know, they are inflation fighters in a way that we haven't seen uh, in the past 30 years. Rebecca Patterson of Bridgewater and Greg Peters of PGM will be staying with us as we turn from what the markets did this week to what investors should do with these markets. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. There was, to be sure, the odd sliver of good news for us human beings, too. The oil price dived below $25 a barrel, amid on-again, off-again hopes of peaceful Mideast settlement, and that added to the outlook for lower inflation and interest rates. That was Louis Ruckheiser, of course, on Wall Street Week back in early January 1991, $25 barrel oil, believe it or not. That was when we were still hoping to avoid a war with Iraq over its invasion of Kuwait at the time. Now we're dealing with a very different war, but once again, oil and commodities more generally are in the forefront. To go over how to manage your portfolio in these uncertain times, Gary Peters of PGM and Rebecca Patterson of Bridgewater have stayed with us. So, Rebecca, let me come back to you. You mentioned commodities earlier here. Uh, given what's going on, does the 60-40 portfolio make sense right now? And should I have commodities in my portfolio, given where the prices are? You should absolutely have commodities in your portfolio. What's given us diversification in portfolios for the last 40 years is not working. Now, we don't know if, if bonds as a diversifier are dead or in a coma. I think they're probably in a coma. But the point is, it could last for a while. And in the interim, what are you going to do to have balance in your portfolio? You need something that will protect you against inflation that's higher than expected for longer than expected. And what we've found is when we look back at tightening cycles, going back to the 1960s, especially early in the tightening cycle, you see commodities consistently outperforming both stocks and bonds and giving you that balance that right now bonds just can't do. Uh, so, Greg, she just said the bonds are in a coma. I think them's fighting words for you here at fixed income. Do you agree they're in a coma for the time being? Also, I think starting point matters. So in retrospect, with, uh, you know, 100 uh, percent hindsight, you know, perhaps the 10 year 50 basis points wasn't the proper entry point. But we've repriced dramatically since then. Uh, and so the carry aspect and yield aspect of uh, what is much better today. So maybe it's not right this second, but it is increasingly attractive here. Uh, uh, and so at some point, David, you'll see this flip where investors want to shield themselves from risk assets uh, as the Fed hikes rates and slows down the economy. And the, the bond portfolio really asserts itself. So it's a delicate balance. But I will say uh, bonds are increasingly attractive here, not less attractive. I agree with you. As, as it sells off and the yield rises, that's certainly the case, as it would be with any asset. The question I'm having is, with real yield still negative, how high do you need to see a nominal Treasury yield to see that switch flip? Do you have a number in mind? Is it timing in mind? What would make you put pound your fist on the table and say, time to get back in Treasuries? Yeah, well, Rebecca, I wish I had that uh, mm -hmm. golden number, so to speak. But uh, history does tell you that, you know, when bond yields approach three and a half percent, it starts to assert itself vis-a-vis -vis equity risk as the uh, Fed is hiking rates. So I'm not sure it's three and a half percent today. It might be a little lower just given the starting point at zero Fed funds. But 
Alternatively, it could be a little higher just given the fact that the Fed has so much work to do to get inflation and growth uh, in check here. Uh, so um, I don't know what the exact number is per se, but we're getting closer. Uh, uh, and as we approach 3%, uh, I am increasingly bullish uh, on the bond market. Absolutely. And it takes me back to commodities again, because one of the things that we're wrestling with is can inflation get back to what the market's pricing in? You know, as, as Greg said earlier, it has shifted a little bit, but still within the next two years, the market is discounting inflation back to around 3%. That could happen, absolutely. But then when you think about the commodity input to that, fixing the supply we've lost from Russia and Ukraine across a range of commodities, not just energy, but metals, even agriculture, it looks like it's going to take years, not months, not quarters. And so you've seen a new supply equilibrium. So yes, demand would come down if the economy slows, but with a new supply equilibrium, what is the price we settle at? And could that be inflationary longer as an input? Um, and I think that also bodes well for not counting on bonds coming back in your favor quickly, but making sure as you balance your portfolio, you're also thinking about inflation sensitive assets. Again, a diversified basket of commodities, oil, metals, gold, et cetera. So, so Greg, uh, again, to come back to fixed income for you, what are the inflation moves and in bonds, if any? I mean, are there things you can do that are inflation protected in the bond, in the fixed income area? I, I think so, David. Uh, I'll tell you up front, it's not tips. Uh, so that provides uh, little to uh, no uh, inflation protection, notwithstanding the name. Uh, but I think there's lots of value still uh, in the credit markets, the spread market. So mining that risk premium uh, uh, still, still is attractive to us. Uh, there's various parts of structured products that look really uh, attractive to us. So being a fixed income investor isn't just about buying yields and duration. There's so many complexities and aspects to it. Uh, and honestly, we're seeing more alpha opportunities today than we have in quite some time. So uh, somewhat perversely, uh, we're, uh, we're pretty uh, excited about the alpha prospects uh, in here. So, so Bridgewater obviously is very diversified in the things you invest in. What are the other inflation-related assets you invest in beyond commodities? Is it real estate? Where else do you go? Sure. So we do like inflation-linked bonds in our portfolios. But beyond that, we're also looking for geographic diversification. So there's going to be some economies that are benefiting from higher commodity prices and, and the global trends taking place. If you look at equity markets year to date, for example, you are seeing positive returns from places like Brazil, um, Mexico, Australia, big commodity exporters. So that's one place to look. Uh, also in the commodity linked currencies, I know that might be getting a little esoteric, but things like the Canadian or Australian dollars, they're posting strong gains against a strong dollar this year. They're outperforming. I think the other thing we're looking for in diversification is economies that are in a different place in their economic cycle. So Japan is, is a country, whenever we write about Japanese <laughs> equities, uh, we, we get stares and yawns. But um, when you think about what's happening there, the Bank of Japan wants a little inflation. They don't have it nearly as badly as we do. And so they're keeping their yields extremely low. They're getting additional fiscal stimulus into the system and China, as they stimulate to try to achieve their growth target, especially with COVID hitting them again, decent nominal growth in the U.S., improving growth in China, um, a very weak yen. The Japanese yen has sold off tremendously against the dollar this year, and the Japanese are fine with it, which helps all their exporting companies. So they're in a position, again, different place in the economic cycle, geographic diversification. That also can be a way to, to play what's going on right now. Uh, Greg, we've been talking about protecting ourselves as an investor against inflation. What about protecting against a recession? As a fixed income investor, how concerned should we be right now that we're going to get paid? Well, watch the yield curve. Uh, so the repricing, uh, as you mentioned this week, I think is somewhat anomalous. So if the curve continues to invert, I think what that's telling you explicitly is that the Fed is hiking into a recession, which de facto means get out of risk assets like equities uh, uh, and into bonds. So bonds will protect you as the economy slows and enters a recession. Uh, that's a tried and true way uh, uh, to uh, protect yourself from, uh, um, you know, that recession risk.
So Rebecca, what about at Bridgewater? What do you do if you're concerned about recession to make sure that you're hedged against that? Well, it's interesting. We've been looking at um, how our, our portfolio has been performing year to date. Equities obviously haven't done well. Um, we're basically neutral equities. We haven't made money in the first quarter by being short equities. We've made money in the first quarter by positioning for higher interest rates, higher commodity prices, and a number of these currency markets that I mentioned earlier. So there are ways to protect yourself without necessarily just taking a view in equities. That said, with equities, we think that, uh, unfortunately, investors are not in a great starting place. The U.S. market today, uh, we'd argue about 40 percent of U.S. stocks are highly sensitive to liquidity conditions. That's gone up a lot in the last decade, and the U.S. is more vulnerable to a li liquidity <coughs> withdrawal than it is Europe or Japan, let's say. And, and a lot of that are the tech stocks the companies that have long-term cash flows. So as the Fed pulls back, and clearly they're going to, May 4th, their next meeting, we're going to see the fireworks. Um, those equities are vulnerable, and guess where everyone's got their money? Um, over the last 10 years, what's outperformed? And so where everyone has crowded over the last decade, that's the area that probably is going to be most vulnerable as the Fed ramps up the tightening cycle. So we think you need to be super careful about U.S. equities in particular going into the next several quarters. Terrific. Thank you so much to Rebecca Patterson of Bridgewater and Greg Peters of PGM. Coming up, we take a look at what's in store next week. And this is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. It's time now to look at the week ahead on Global Wall Street, starting with Juliet Sally in Singapore. Thanks, David. Well, it is all about central bank action, with the PBOC likely to trim a key lending rate in the week ahead to support an economy that is struggling with COVID-19 lockdowns. A rate cut would boost market confidence and help reduce funding costs. China, of course, heading in a completely different direction to many central banks. The RBNZ tipped to raise rates by 25 basis points this week as conflict-related commodity price rises add to inflationary risks. The Monetary Authority here in Singapore also expected to tighten the Bank of Korea may hold. Now over to Danny Berger in London. Danny. Thanks, Juliet. We'll continue to focus on the war in Ukraine as the contours of the war change. Ukrainian officials have made pleas for more weapons from Western nations um, that don't look just like defensive weapons. More offensive weapons shows you how the contours are changing. Now, beyond that, we'll look at how any sanctions also evolve. Uh, more energy sanctions, pressure from that uh, from nations. We already have a coal ban coming into force from the EU. But will they go so far as to ban oil and gas, something that would, of course, have large consequences for the European economy? Now, over to Romain Bostic in New York. Thanks, Danny. A short week for markets ahead because of Good Friday, but a lot will be packed into the four days prior. U.S. consumer inflation data is due on Tuesday. Economists expect an 8.4 percent gain in March's price index from a year earlier. That would be a fresh four decade high. Producer prices will be released on Wednesday and on Thursday. We're going to get a sense of the state of the American consumer with the release of monthly retail sales figures. And earnings season kicks off again next week with reports from major U.S. banks, including J.P. Morgan, Citigroup, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, and Wells Fargo. We'll also get quarterly reports from Delta Airlines and United Health. David? Thanks to Juliet Sally, Danny Berger, and Romaine Bostic. Coming up, as the United States and China face economic headwinds, is it time for emerging markets to step up, or at least some emerging markets? We hear from Rashir Sharma of Rockefeller International. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. It has been a two-horse race between the United States as the largest economy in the world and China as the one catching up. But now the two lead horses may be struggling, with indications of a slowdown or even a recession in the United States, as former New York Fed President Bill Dudley warns. If you're going to try to get inflation under control, you're going to have to push up the unemployment rate. 
And if you push up the unemployment rate, it's almost impossible to avoid a recession at that point. While China has to cope with shutdowns from COVID, high debt, and a weakening property market. Let's be clear, though. I mean, the real issue in China really isn't the delistings in the, here in the U.S. It's up front, in your face. It's $92 billion of foreign denominated debt that is coming due in the property sector. We know they're feeling the pain. If you look at the PMI data just this week, the economy flipped back into contraction. Wait. So things are, on, are tough on the ground in China. But even with all that, and the war in Ukraine's continued effect on the global economy, the one thing that is coming up roses right now is commodities, which raises the specter of the future belonging more to some of the emerging economies rich in things like oil and wheat and minerals. Well, we do favor commodities, uh, really more for the longer view. We think we're at the beginning of a, a super cycle, reflecting underinvestment over the past couple of years. And to take us through this comparison between the economies of the United States and China on the one hand and emerging markets on the other, we welcome now Rashir Sharma. He is the chairman of Rockefeller International and the author of 10 Rules of Successful Nations. Rashir, thank you so much for being with us. Before we talk about emerging nations, let's talk about U.S. and China, because in recent years, the story's all been about U.S. and China and the strength of those economies. Why is that not going to continue? Well, I think, David, if you look at the pattern of economic history, what you find is that when nations do very well in one decade, it is very hard to repeat that kind of success in the subsequent decade. And the last decade, as you pointed out, really belonged to America and China. America emerged from that as a financial superpower in a way that it almost never was. As you well know now that 90% uh, of all transactions in the world are done through the US dollar. Uh, as a financial superpower, America uh, reached new heights by the end of the decade. And China too had an amazing decade with its uh, share in the global economy expanding very rapidly. But I think that both those nations now are gonna hit or are hitting some significant roadblocks. In China, we're seeing the challenges of demographics and debt. For the first time now, the Chinese population is beginning to shrink. I think that's a huge development. And there has been no growth story that has been able to sustain itself where the population of a country is shrinking. And China is now exhibit A of that. And the United States, I think after a great decade, I wrote a lot about how the US was gonna be the comeback nation of the 2010s. The US seems pretty overstretched as well. And the way it has weaponized the US dollar just now in the fight against Russia, I think will also have consequences where the rest of the world is fighting or looking how to get off this dollar standard. So, Rashid, that explains why perhaps the United States and China won't do as well in the next 10 years as they did in the last. What makes us think that the emerging markets are in a place to pick up the slack? Well, I think there are a couple of things going on for emerging markets here. One, I think it's really important to put this in perspective, that these emerging markets that we're talking about, whether it's India, Indonesia, or even the likes of uh, Eastern Europe, these countries did not have the resources to spend that much on stimulus when the pandemic hit. So these countries really were forced to carry out some more fundamental reform. In India, the priority seems to have shifted again towards economic growth. They are focusing more on issues like privatization. Indonesia, they're changing the labor laws. So I think what you're seeing in emerging markets is the difference between stimulus, which the Western countries adopted in great measure, and in emerging markets, which did some stimulus, but not to the same extent. So they were forced to carry out more productivity enhancing reforms to try and revive the animal spirits. So I think that's one very important factor. The second has to do with commodities, that if you look at the history of emerging markets, typically emerging markets do very well when commodity prices rise because so many emerging markets in Latin America, Middle East, Africa are big exporters of commodities. And one of the big themes of this decade, which is shaping up, is that we seem to be at the start of a new commodity super cycle uh, because we cut investment back so sharply in commodities. And now it seems as if demand's gonna still be strong for commodities, even for building a new green infrastructure, yet the supply has been severely constrained. So I think that that's why this could end up being a pretty good decade for commodities. And that's very helpful for many emerging markets. Rusher, as you know very well, uh, there isn't just one class of emerging markets. Each one is quite different from the other. Take the two things you just talked about, reforms on the one hand and commodities on the other. Which are the particular emerging markets that might benefit from one or the other, or maybe both of those? 
Yeah, so I think that um, you have countries such as uh, Brazil, Saudi Arabia, I think some of these countries could do quite well compared to expectations. Uh, I think the, the important thing here is that the expectations have been reset. Uh, and so no one expects these countries to do very well. But some of these countries could do quite well because they're so dependent on commodity prices. And now you have commodity prices going higher. Even in places like South Africa, um, the domestic demand could do quite well if the mining sector revs up again. Now, in terms of the sweet spot where the country could benefit from both, possibly a country like Indonesia, which has both commodity exports and has also carried out some economic reforms. So I think that these are some of the storylines in emerging markets that could do quite well in the coming decade. Rushir, you have a piece in Foreign Affairs, the current edition of Foreign Affairs, that struck me when you did a comparison of the extent to which the U.S. and China occupied the, the global market or the global economy, as opposed to their, their, uh, the value of the stocks, and, and how that compares to emerging markets that would suggest that perhaps the U.S. is overbought. Go through those numbers. Yeah, I think that this is the extreme value trade out there, so to speak. But if you think about it for the next five to 10 years, so here's the snapshot. The United States today is roughly about 26% of the global economy. But the U US stock market today is over 60% of global stock market capitalization. That's a huge gap that's opened up, a gap that was never there. At the start of last decade, the number was 25% of uh, global economy was the US uh, share. But the share in the stock market, uh, global cap, was about 40% or so. So massive gap has opened up out here. Now, some people say this is because the U.S. has so many global companies. Even adjusting for that, the U.S. share in global stock market cap is over 50%. I think that's far too much of an allocation of capital towards uh, the United States. At the other end of the spectrum are emerging markets, uh, especially emerging markets outside of China, uh, which account for more than 20% of the global economy but their share in the global stock market capitalization is well below 10%. So this, like for me, represents a lot of value out there, which is that a lot of capital is allocated towards the United States. The United States is very expensive today as a stock market. In fact, the US stock market today, compared to the rest of the world, is trading at a 100-year high. Uh, that's a very wide uh, gap. And emerging markets are at the other end of the spectrum. Historically, they're very cheap. The currencies are also quite cheap, and their share in the global stock market cap is way below their economic weight. I expect this gap to close in the coming decade. Rashir, let's talk about some things that could hold back emerging markets, and particularly the commodities that you referred to that are good on the upside when you're selling them. On the other hand, they, the, these emerging markets need energy, and they need food as well, and often they will subsidize that for their population. Could that hold some of the emerging markets back? Yeah, you know, the thing about emerging markets is that there are about 150 developing countries out there. There are only about 40 countries that are classified as developed. So there are 150 developing countries out there, and there are many storylines uh, there. And there will be some nations which will bear the brunt of higher commodity prices as well, which are large importers of these commodities. The turmoil we're seeing in a Sri Lanka, uh, in places even like Pakistan, and then also we have uh, in places like Peru, uh, which is should be a beneficiary of high commodity prices, but currently a lot of protests are taking place because of high energy prices. So there will be some countries which will get hit by that. But on average, if you look at the history of development economics, what it tells you is that the decades when commodity prices do well tend to be the decade for emerging markets. I would say that emerging markets tend to do much better with higher commodity prices than lower commodity prices because they export so much of uh, raw materials and energy. One final one, Rashir. What about how they deal with uh, increased interest costs? Because there's a lot of external debt for a lot of these emerging markets, and it looks like interest costs are going up. That's true. Uh, now, the couple of counters I have to that is that, one, that Many of these emerging markets have already increased interest rates. So unlike the Fed and the Western central banks, these emerging markets are somewhat ahead of the curve rather than being so behind the curve. So that shock has been partially absorbed. The second thing is that they've become much less dependent on foreign capital. The key thing to remember is this. 150 plus developing countries out there, there will be many storylines. 
But on balance, if you look at the picture, and especially the relative picture compared to the US, which has also taken on a lot of debt, uh, the prospects for emerging markets look much better than they did a decade ago. And the US is the mirror image of that. A lot for investors to chew on in there. Thank you so much to Rashir Sharma. He's the chairman of Rockefeller International. Coming up, we wrap up the week with our special contributor, Larry Summers of Harvard. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David West, and we are joined once again this week by our very special contributor, Larry Summers of Harvard. So, Larry, the big issue everyone's discussing is can the Fed bring about what is called a soft landing? I guess that's to say avoid a recession. As you know, Bloomberg did a survey of 72 economists that show the economists are getting more and more skeptical. It's up to 27.5 percent in April. Before, it was 20 percent. If you go two months back, it was 15 percent. Look, I think the risks are going way up. 27.5% this year, because next year is riskier than this year, translates to something getting towards two-thirds for a two-year period, and I'd be a bit above that in my judgment. Here's the key fact. We have never had a moment in the United States when inflation was above four and unemployment was below four, when we didn't have a recession two years within the next uh, two years. So we may pull it off, and certainly it's hugely important that we succeed in pulling it off, but the combination of overheating followed by policy delay followed by supply shocks means I think it's a very difficult set of uh, challenges, and recession in the next uh, couple of years is clearly more likely than not. Some of the banks are starting to move in that direction. Your survey moved in that direction, and I suspect that's how the consensus will evolve. And, Larry, I feel like we're caught a little bit between the rock and the hard place. That is between inflation on the one hand and recession on the other. And we worry particularly about how the people who are less fortunate are affected. You have a research paper from the National Bureau of Economic Research this week talking about what happens with wage growth. You would like to think that when wages grow, that helps everybody. Not necessarily so. Here's the, here's the fact, uh, David, if you just look at nominal wage growth, just measured wage growth, and growth in workers' purchasing power, up to a point, perhaps 4 percent, 4.5 percent, they move together. But past that point, because when inflation's running above 4 percent, you start to have inflation, th serious inflation. Things move in the high opposite direction, and higher wage growth seems to go with lower growth in workers' purchasing power. That's why I was so anxious uh, on this show over the last year about the possibility of overheating uh, labor markets. And unfortunately, that's what seems to be uh, materializing with average real wages having one of their worst performances over the last year. Uh, that we have seen. Larry, we've got a big event coming up on the weekend. That's the first round of in the presidential election over in France. We have Marine Le Pen, who was often thought to be just almost impossible to elect, although it's a closer race at the moment than we would have thought. What's going on there? Look, I'm not a political expert on uh, France, but what I see is eerily reminiscent of the period before Brexit in the U.S., in the, in the U.K., and the period before Donald Trump's 2016 election in the United States. I think by far the more likely thing is that President Macron will win, but we have to recognize that the fact that Marie Le Pen will ultimately be elected looks at least as plausible now as Donald Trump's election did a bit before the U.S. election or as Brexit did a bit before uh, the British uh, election. So I think we need to be nervous as we watch that situation. And all people of goodwill have to be standing with uh, the French uh, people. But I think this shows uh, the power of um, 
pocketbook issues for regular people and frustration with uh, elites, which has been a potent political force all over the world. Again, I think this is going to end with President uh, Macron, but nobody should be serene or complacent that that's the case. And part of the reason why Ms. Le Pen is catching up with Mr. Macron actually has to do with Ukraine, because Mr. Macron has really been focused on Ukraine and international issues, while Marine Le Pen is focusing on how much people pay at the gas tech and also for their food. So let's talk about what's going on now, right now with Ukraine and Russia. And my question is, is Russia really prevailing or at least fighting to a stalemate the United States when it comes to the economic war as opposed to the military war, much the way Russia seems to be losing or at a stalemate in the military war? I think we're going to need to uh, ratchet it up if we want to do grave damage to the Russian uh, economy. We can't allow it to continue to be the case that uh, Russia is able to get huge levels of hard currency from uh, the sale of products. It can't continue to be the case that there's a way that the Russian financial system can connect in a global context, but that is going to mean uh, some sacrifice. And I think the question is whether the West is going to be prepared uh, to make uh, those uh, sacrifices. Uh, I certainly hope so, and I think President Biden has shown wonderful leadership uh, on this, but a huge amount depends on uh, Europe uh, right now. I hope we will be prepared to spend a dollar on arming Ukraine for every two or three dollars that we allow Russia to get in hard currency by exporting energy products uh, to uh, Europe. If we do that, Ukraine would be in a much stronger position to win this, uh, win this war and repel this uh, barbaric uh, invasion. And Larry, in the meantime, the COVID pandemic is not over. Just ask the people in Shanghai. Look at what's happened in Shanghai. It's so dramatic. Who would have thought this would happen? At the same time, China seems to be backing off a little bit some of its distance from the West. For example, with respect to the audit position with publicly traded companies from China. Is President Xi feeling the pressure there? I, I think there must be sweaty palms behind the facade in uh, China right now. David, I've been saying for some time that it's a mistake to view China as a rampaging economic giant in the way that many in the United States viewed Japan at the end of the 1980s, that between exit from COVID, profound financial strains, internal uh, issues around uh, inequality, tension over state enterprises, China has real economic uh, vulnerabilities. What I'm fearful of is that those vulnerabilities will translate into hostile nationalist uh, impulses as a way of holding uh, the country together when the glue of rapidly growing uh, prosperity starts uh, to peel and uh, flake off. So I think we need to be doing a lot of hard thinking about how we're approaching China going forward. And finally, Larry, let's finish with a couple of rapid fire questions. First, Elon Musk, very much in the news this week because he took that big stake in Twitter. What did you make of that? Elon Musk and Twitter seem almost uh, made for each other. It's hard to imagine a less uh, passive uh, shareholder. I suspect that's going to give the business press a lot of stuff to cover going forward. And finally, Larry, I'm used to seeing your name in the front section of the New York Times, not so much the sports section. And by the way, it was tied to the Masters. I thought maybe you were competing this year. No such, no such luck uh, for me. The course record is 40 strokes uh, behind my score. But I was talking about record inflation in the Augusta pimento and cheese uh, sandwiches, which is an illustration, alas, of how pervasive inflation now is in our economy.
Well, like the azaleas, Hope Springs and Turtle, I'm hoping for you next year to trim off those strokes and be competing. Thank you so much to our very special contributor at Wall Street Week. He is Larry Summers of Harvard. Coming up, when 280 characters meet $270 billion, which one wins? This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Finally, one more thought. Maybe space isn't the final frontier after all. Elon Musk took on the challenge of climate change by building himself an electric car company, and he created a $270 billion personal fortune in the process. Elon's a big picture guy, and I think what he's simply saying is, I'm an innovator. I have transformed the American auto industry, the global auto industry. Then he took on space, what Star Trek called the final frontier creating a profitable SpaceX that so far has launched 2,000 satellites into orbit, already has permission for another 12,000, and is seeking permission for even more, some 30,000 more. Now to Elon Musk's turn to make space history with the first spaceship to launch an all-civilian crew into orbit. And, oh yes, he wants to lead a manned mission to Mars before the decade is out. It is very important, essential, that over the long term, that we become a multi-planet species and ultimately even go beyond the solar system and bring life with us. But not content to master climate and space, and for that matter, tunneling under our cities with his boring company and connecting our cities through hyperloops, Elon Musk may now have taken on his biggest challenge of all, taming, or at least influencing, the world of information. And one stock taking center stage, it is Twitter. Elon Musk becoming the largest shareholder, taking a 9.2% stake. Initially, he said he'd be a passive investor, something that no one from Dan Ives of Wedbush to Kathy Wood of ARC believed even for one minute. I think this is just the start of M Musk uh, on Twitter. I mean, ultimately, it's not going to just end with a passive stake. I do think for the moment it's passive, but he's uh, certainly making a statement, and uh, it's a statement about censorship. And sure enough, by the middle of the week, Mr. Musk had moved from passive to active, joining the Twitter board and promising what he calls significant improvements. And who knows, maybe he really can change the face of social media. But then again, he should be careful that he doesn't follow in the footsteps of another legendary mogul who dreamed of dominating the media world. Rosebud. Could the rosebud of Citizen Kane become the Twitter of Citizen Musk. That does it for this episode of Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This is Bloomberg. See you next week.